Okay, we're yeah. live. We are recording. Um, I will jump in with just the first question here. Being, um, we'd love to know a little bit about your journey into the space of Ethereum and kind of how you got here. What kind of happened to bring you to this? Sure. Um, can I go way, way back? Uh, yeah, to the go, go as far back as feels good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, as a high schooler, I thought I was going to become an oil painter. I had always been very creative. I loved painting. I loved making colorful messes. And so, um, I don't know, I just had this idea in my head. I want to make it to the Bay Area, the big city, and like become an artist. And so that's what brought me physically here to this area. Um, it was very, uh, not long after I moved here that I realized I needed um, to pick up some other skills to be able to pay my rent, especially around here, it's very expensive. Um, and that was before like the big, big t tech boom that had happened in the last like five years or so. Um, so I resolved to learn graphic design and that kind of led me into the startup world um, where my very first gig was designing banner ads for, they're like fancy banner ads, um, you know, really exciting, really impactful work. Uh, but the, the benefit of that opportunity or like the luck really for me was um, I landed in a place where there was a product team, there were engineers, there were product managers, um, I learned what UX design is. I learned that as a designer, you could have a greater impact with your work beyond just the visual stuff. And that is what led me into learning more about UX, UI, learning about usability testing and research. Um, and that, that's really what like brought me to a place where <clears throat> I was doing freelance work, um, with startups, really small dev teams, like two to three guys hacking in a closet together kind of startup. Um, and so I, I quickly realized that the value I could bring to those teams was like, I'm a very visual person joining a team that's highly technical. Um, I love talking to people and hearing their stories and understanding their problems. And so um, I realized that 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 was really valuable to those teams as well. Just like surfacing, hey, you're speaking about a thing in this way, but like the other people that we're trying to serve think about it in a totally different way. And so, yeah, connecting those two worlds, um, like that's the space that I love to be in, uh, that I realized through that experience. Um, and in terms of how I got into Ethereum, it was honestly just luck. Uh, I had a design mentor who uh, wrote to me one day and said, hey, I have this client. They need a designer to make their desktop app mobile responsive. Can you help them out? And um, I said, yeah, sure, I'll talk to them. And um, this is one of the team's three dudes working in a closet. <laughs> um, this is the Purse IO team. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that service, but their whole um, mission is to incentivize the use of Bitcoin. And so they've created this whole e-commerce system uh, to enable people to basically buy things on Amazon using Bitcoin. Um, and then on the other side, basically allowing people to buy Bitcoin with Amazon gift cards. Oh, so it's like a it's like a exchanging service, right? Like people have yeah. gift cards and people have Bitcoin and they just swap them. For like the purchase. Yeah. Of okay. Interesting. Yeah, basically. Um, so yeah, it's a marketplace where we're connecting people who want Bitcoin and people who want Amazon goods in exchange for Bitcoin. Um, so yeah, at the time when I first joined that team, uh, the way the user experience worked is you had to create a wish list on Amazon and paste in the link, and then like say how much Bitcoin you're willing to spend for that order, like. Yeah, it was like the first, it was the seed of the idea. And so a lot of my work there was like building it out into a UI that looked more like an e-commerce site, that looked more like Amazon, um, something that people were like familiar with 
using to shop. Feels like a um, tricky thing though, because the price of Bitcoin is fluctuating all the time. So like maybe one week you'll spend 0.2, but the next week you're like willing to spend only half of that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, totally. Um, so yeah, one of the big, biggest challenges we had working on that product was, um, yeah, that managing expectations and uh, figuring out what to do with that like risk element. Do I feel comfortable putting this Bitcoin? It, it wasn't a smart contract, but basically like putting this Bitcoin in a place where I don't have access to it and hoping that um, the markets like work out in my favor. Um, yeah, you have to tie tie it up, right? Like you're you're setting it there in like kind of a a vault essentially that's like it'll go out according to the things you want but you can't change your mind within this period of time so uh -huh. if the market moves like then you know, you're locked in so yeah managing expectations and you know feels like communication would be a major part of that right communicating to your users like what's happening at all times and where the where the funds are and they're safe and your order is being fulfilled and when it's going to arrive yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and through that experience, I learned that um, my, my assumption going into it was like, oh, the people who are using this service, they're all Bitcoin nerds, like they love the technology and they're just like excited to use it for something. Um, and there were absolutely a lot of people like that using the service. Um, like for them, they had a lot of tolerance for like market fluctuations. They're like, yeah, if I lose money on this, it's fine. Like. I'm supporting the community, I'm using the tech, um, like those things were really driving their usage. Um, but I also discovered there was this whole other segment of people who were not into Bitcoin at all. They were just there for the potential savings that they could get on items. Um, I won't get too deep into how all those discounts work, but basically there is this whole um, group of like drop shippers who are like, yeah, uh, didn't really know anything about Bitcoin. They just knew that they needed to buy it and use it to get this discount that they wanted. Um, so for them, there was even more education that we needed to do around. What is this tech? Where do you buy Bitcoin? How do you store it? Um, yeah, what is an escrow? Why does that matter? Um, why can't I get a refund? Stuff like that. It feels like these are um, like, they're also they're not just like essential for like what you're doing right as far as like relaying all the pieces of the puzzle to people but you're also like educating consumers in a new way for like this is a potential benefit to you and these are the elements that are going to be important to you and what i find especially in the ethereum space is like people just want to use it and they want to use it now and they don't want it to be hard or difficult and one of the major hurdles i've seen to adoption is like there's just too many steps. There's like, click, download this. If you lose that, all your things are gone. And you're like, I have 12 words, what? <laughs> like, there's all these little pieces. And it's like, that is a UX, a user experience designer's nightmare. Cause they're like, before anyone even gets into using my product, they have to deal with all this stuff. Like, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's a challenge for sure. Yeah. Also, as someone who's not as familiar with the land of cryptocurrency making the so you made the jump from kind of doing startup ux ui and then working on this project with you call it purse.io is that right mm -hmm. how was it kind of your process of coming into the community what was that like was there like a big culture shock were you surprised by anything um yeah let me hear about that yeah that's a great question um it was definitely a culture shock for me. Um, there was just a lot to learn. There was so much to learn. And the folks that I was working with were highly technical. They like, they knew so much. So a lot of what I would do when I would work with them is I would just like sit and overhear the things that they were talking about and try to absorb as much as I could. And then I would make notes of things to like go research later. <laughs> Um, but what really like got me, you know, starting to use it is the founder of this company insisted on paying everyone in Bitcoin. Uh, and now 
looking back, like that was pretty freaking awesome because it forced me to learn it and it forced me to figure out like, what can I do with this? What's the best way to sell it? Um, and, you know, I started getting into the trading aspect, trying to time when do I sell my paycheck to try to maximize the income that I was getting. Um, so a lot of that transition was like kind of being thrown in the deep end and learning to swim. That's one of the wacky things, right? Is like, I do the same thing. Like when I'm taking on client projects, I'm like getting tokens from a client. And then you see that those tokens go up and you're like, oh, well, my paycheck just went from 5K to 15K in a matter of three days. And you're like, well, that's good. I should like sell that now, right? Like that's the really interesting thing. It's There's risk also, but there's also like a huge amount of potential benefit that people, I mean, it feels really, exciting to me like i don't know like I, for maybe for some people they'd rather know that like 5k is their monthly budget but for me the like the risk the downside risk it doesn't feel like so bad when like you're in a bull market at least right like we're in, uh, we're in the middle of this kind of um rush right where a lot of people are getting into the technology they're buying into cryptocurrencies and so all the currency boats are rising people are just flooding in and the market's seeing a lot of movement and that's good for all tokens. Well, at least all tokens on Ethereum. Bitcoin is also doing good as well, but I wouldn't say nearly as like not moving as upwards as strongly as the Ethereum community has because a lot of other things built out like DeFi on top of it. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I totally relate to that feeling of like the excitement but also a bit of like fear of like seeing your balance going up and down. Um, yeah, when I initially started getting paid in Bitcoin, it was valued at $200. Oh. And, and now it's valued at 10,000. Yeah. <laughs> so that's pretty great, right? Like, yeah, um, I mean, at the time I was like, I get paid, I gotta sell it right now. Yeah. I don't know what's going to happen. Could go down, like, could go to 100. Yeah. yeah. Volatile. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so for me, the way I kind of got started with the investment aspect is I would sell like 90% of it and I'd hold on to 10%. And then I would just kind of trade with that. Um, but yeah, certainly the year of like 20, 2015 to 2016 was massive growth where we saw, yeah, $200 of Bitcoin up to like, I think it was like 18k was the peak like that one day spike that went up so um certainly that was a very exciting time to be in the bitcoin space or just in crypto space in general um but of course 2017 you... 2018 that is fun <laughs> how did you feel though when you were like first involved in that space and then the currencies really started to take off like as being a being a member of a team that was building on top of like Bitcoin or currencies, how did that feel to you? Like, did you feel like you were kind of like part of something new, crazy? Like, were, like what was it? What, what were you thinking? Yeah, totally. Uh, new, crazy, wild west, new frontier kind of feelings. Um, at the time, I didn't know any other designer that was working in the crypto space. Uh, like when I would meet other teams, I would be like, hey, do you have any designers working over there? <laughs> like it really was a very uh, niche community and it's not like I could look online and see like, what are best practices for designing a crypto checkout? Like that just did not exist. Um, so it really did feel like we were, yeah, creating brand new patterns for how folks interact with this new technology. Um, yeah, I know in the beginning, sorry to cut you off, uh, if you yeah. wanted to that. Um, I know in the beginning you, you talked about wanting to be a painter and loving the like creative mess. And do you feel like you're, this is a very different application of creativity, but do you feel like it is that like need for kind of creative exploration is satiated through the work that you've done with design in the crypto space? Yeah, that's a really great question. I would say yes. Um, I mean, you can see behind me, I, there's some paintings back here. I'm still doing the painting thing occasionally, like for fun, but um, 
I personally find a lot of fulfillment in um, connecting the dots between concepts, maybe abstract concepts or very complex technical concepts with like the very real life, okay, how does my Aunt Linda interact with this thing? And like bridging the gap between those, that is a creative exercise, in my opinion. Absolutely. Um, the medium is very different, right? Um, it's more of a strategic, strategic uh, space. Um, then there are also opportunities to add like the visual beauty prettifying the things that we're working on as well. Um, like on the purse project, for example, uh, the original UI was very, very much looked like a spreadsheet <laughs> in a sense, you know, it wasn't, um, you know, it was built to be functional. It wasn't built to be a, you know, beautiful UI. And so um, through that project, like we had the opportunity of designing a mascot, designing like cool banners and learning animation and um, creating some cool swag and um, really exploring this like to the moon meme space um, to the point where we had like a space suit in our office at one point we were doing photo shoots with a big helmet. Um, uh, so I still find opportunities, find ways to like infuse that like kind of experimental, visual, colorful stuff, um, even on projects that are quite technical. Definitely. I think when, at least in my experience, when I was a kid, when folks talked about creativity, I really only viewed it in a like visual arts sense. And as I get older, I'm recognizing how many ways you can find space for creativity in so many different fields. And it seems like you've kind of carved out that space to yourself where there really was a need having there no other visual designers in the space. Um, were you able to make them despite there being no other kind of views <laughs> at the time? Were you able to find some mentors or relationships that kind of helped you along in navigating the space? Um. I definitely found other designers. Um, like one that comes to mind is Darren, who is a Raid Guild member, um, who actually recruited me to Raid Guild. Uh, so I, I credit him for pulling me into the Ethereum space. Um, but how long ago was that? Were you involved in Ethereum before you joined the Raid Guild DAO, or was it like your first? You'd done Bitcoin, you'd done Purse, and then you were like traveling in Europe or something, and then you came back and you were like. Um, yeah, I hadn't worked in the Ethereum space before Raid Guild. I have been a collector of tokens for a long time now. Um, just through my experience with Bitcoin, naturally I like branched out into like, oh, I'm gonna collect some Ethereum, I'm gonna look into some token projects and stuff like that, but I hadn't actually worked on a project myself. Um, yeah, so after my stint with Purse, I kind of took a step back and I started working on a project that's totally unrelated to crypto <laughs> at all. Um, so I did that for a while and was also like doing some freelance, random freelance projects with other startups in the, I don't know, San Francisco tech bubble space. Um, I, wanna, I wanna just like dig into that a little bit more what was it like going from working on the stuff with Purse and working in the Bitcoin community to then going back to working on freelance stuff in the San Francisco tech community? Uh, there were a lot less memes. Uh, <laughs> Crypto a lot runs less on emoji. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. That's that. It's one thing I really love about the crypto community is there's this lighthearted, fun element to the work that we do. Um, and memes are a really big part of that. Animated GIFs are everywhere. Like, it's just, it's more fun, in my opinion. Uh, I mean, certainly there are SF bubble tech startups that have fun like that, um, but it's less common, I think. Um, it feels so, yeah, like the, 
I was going to say, it feels like the vibe is like very Burning Man-esque and we're, I think all three of us are burners here. So we probably know what that yeah. is like, that playfulness, that like willingness to be a little bit silly or vulnerable, which kind of is like, makes things a more real, more human. Yeah, 100% agree with that. Um, and yeah, as you mentioned that, like shortly after I joined Raid Guild, and I started like just adding things in the chats and just kind of observing how people were interacting with each other. The thought crossed my mind like, oh, this is like the burner community, but it's Ethereum. It's like the, the like Venn diagram of like burners and Ethereum feels like it's overlaps a lot, or at least culturally that feeling of like, we're working together, we're building cool stuff. We don't take ourselves seriously, but we take our work seriously. Um, and it's this yes and kind of energy where it's like, you do a thing. Oh yeah, and wouldn't it be cool if we build this other thing on top of that? Oh yeah, and like, I wanna spin off and do this other thing. Um, so personally, I find that culture really energizing um, and exciting to be a part of. Yeah, I love that. And I think that's um, a great kind of yeah, what, what am I, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but like, it's an opportunity for people to look at this space, look at the Ethereum space. And like, I can't speak for all of Ethereum, obviously, right? But I can speak for like the DAOs that I'm involved in, which are like Raid Guild among others. There is a spirit of like, yeah, doing serious work and having really high level people who are capable, but also like, like having fun, memeing, like hanging out, like, I feel like the community that we have in Raid Guild, which is a really tight knit community, is as much friends and like, you know, people who are supportive of one another as it is like people who are working on a project who have timelines and have to ship stuff and stuff and in that way. And it's a, di it's a different approach, right? Like you don't really, in my experience, you don't want to leave your work at home and like, you're like, cool, I'm done with that. Now I'm done with the office. You're kind of like, you're tinkering, you're paying attention. You're like seeing what others are sharing. And, you know, over the, was it like two weeks ago where you were sharing all of your DJ sets that you were doing for your, uh, for your Burning Man camp in the community. And I was like, this is so much more real, right? Like, where would we get a chance to view this stuff and to see that other side of you? If, if we were in an office together and we were like working on building SaaS products, like, yeah. you know, like it wouldn't really happen, right? There wouldn't be the culture for that. Um, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, the only other company I can think of where I felt like I could express myself in that way, like bring my whole self, right? To use that common phrase. Um, but I think for me, like infusing my love for music, my love for art and design, like finding ways to, I don't know, throw out some visual ideas, that, that stuff is really important to me and how I work with others. Um, and like when I worked at Purse, um, we had a lot of really fun rituals that we would do just to make, yeah, our experience working together more fun. And I really view my time there as like, developing a sort of family with the people that I was working with because you know yeah we were working really hard we were building some cool stuff we were learning a ton together but also like you would play cool playlists you know during the day we would sing a ring a singing bowl before every meeting um yeah probably don't put this into the the article, but our CEO would like light up a joint before every board meeting, you know? Um, so there yeah, it's like yeah. a different, a very different spin on what work is. Um, where some of the more traditional SaaS startups are very much like you wear your button up shirt. Um, you don't talk about personal stuff at all. Um, well, the cultural expectations are more of like a suppression of your culture and a forcing of like corporate culture, right? Like these are mm. the expectations, these are the norms and like you're expected to conform to those norms to like survive or present a, 
you know, a, a face of yourself. Whereas like in Ethereum and maybe in DAOs in general, it's like, we really want to see you as a person, right? Because you're choosing to come here. You weren't hired to come here. Like with Raid Guild, actually, you have to like put up money to get into Raid Guild to then take on projects. Um, how was how how is that mentally for you? Like, I'm guessing, so Raid Guild was the first DAO you joined, right? Official DAO on Ethereum. Yeah. What did you think when someone was like, okay, yeah, you need to put up like $200 worth of credit to then get in this club? Like, what, how was that being a UX person? Um, I'll just say, I don't think I would have felt comfortable doing it if I didn't have my friend Darren saying, oh yeah, this is just how it works, <laughs> basically. Um, I mean, he shared a lot of information with me, but he's like, here's a handbook, here's a thing, and if you wanna do it, like you could earn your way in or you could pay a tribute. And I was like, yeah, I'll just, you know, I have ETH, I'll just, yeah, I'll just put it in there. Um, I think knowing that I could rage quit that and get some of the value back helped me feel comfortable. Um, just as context for people who might not understand, like, uh, oh, yeah. yeah, you want to explain Mollux, like, for one second? <laughs> uh, do you want to explain? <laughs> yeah, I'll just give a super TLDR, like, a Mollux yeah. DAO is, like, the framework. It's a base layer of the way the DAO is structured. And there are certain things you can and can't do inside of a Mollux DAO. And the name of our Mollux DAO is Raid Guild. And one of the things you can do is you can rage quit. So that means that to join the DAO, you have to stake some tokens. She staked ETH to join, which is what all members are expected to do so that we have skin in the game. Um, but you can rage quit, another funny term, whenever you want. So those shares that you pledged, that you staked essentially, they always belong to you. But it's a way to keep uh, the community aligned. And it's a way to give you free autonomy to do what you want with your funds because we spend those funds as a group on improving the project and doing cool things and funding people to um, take on things like more internal work. Like we have this really cool brand shop initiative that Jackie, I believe you're like pushing some really cool stuff um, to there, but will be an internal project where we want to create really cool merchandise that will then sell to the community uh, to help pay for Red Guild. That was a long TLDR. <laughs> No, thank you for explaining that because I'm, I'm, yeah, when you start talking about these things, I'm like, cool, cool. But then I also have like seven follow up questions. So it's helpful for me <laughs> selfishly to get some explanations. And, um, and how long have you been a part of Raid Guild? Uh, a couple months. Months. Yeah. Um, What's not that very been long. Like? What's that been like for you? Like, what kind of projects have you been working on? And, and how is it? How's it going? I'm having a lot of fun. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm having a lot of fun. Um, the first project I took on was helping design the portfolio pages for Raid Guild's website. Um, and we're like this close to shipping. I'm like, you just gotta push it over the finish line. We're almost there. Um, but that was really fun because uh, I was working on it with Darren and Ven and they were kind of like, do whatever you think is best. Um, so I was able to like work on a project plan, like work on wireframes, figure out what kind of content we want to show. Um, and then it was an opportunity for me to actually practice HTML, CSS, and React. Um, so I was able to actually build out the pages myself, which was really fun too. Um, just for me is uh, one of my learning goals is to get more comfortable with coding. And so um, I thought it was really cool that they were like, oh yeah, you wanna do that? Go for it. <laughs> like have fun. Uh, that's what we're here to do is to have fun and build cool stuff. So um, that was a really great in intro project for me. Um, and now I am working on the Open Grants project um, with Ven and Dan. <clears throat> And um, yeah, designing the UI for that. So working in Figma, um, being in wireframes, basically um, making suggestions for how to improve the user experience of the system that they're creating. 
and then also adding some visual flair uh, to make it pretty and enjoyable to use. And then there's this other project called Tula uh, I'm working on with Ven. It's not crypto related necessarily, although I could see crypto being involved in it at some point in the future. Uh, but it's basically a web app um, to connect busy, uh, busy, I would say female entrepreneurs or um, female business women who like are probably moms, they have a lot going on, they have a lot on their plate, and they want to just kind of outsource tasks to someone else. Uh, so it's like a to-do app where you're like, yeah, I need to buy a gift for for my mom, and I need to pick up my dry cleaner or whatever. Uh, and basically their, their community will make sure that the to-do list gets done. Um, oh yeah, that, that's like totally crypto native, right? You just put a bounty on that and you're like, boom, there's an ETH on that task. You claim it, the task sun yeah. person pays it out. That's really interesting. I like that. So you have three different projects going at once. How's that for you? It's kind of a lot right now. <laughs> um, I would say at this point I'm maxed out. I mm -hmm. wouldn't take on anything more, although I am sort of advising on the design side for the escrow rip. Um, so yeah, at this point, I'm like probably gonna have to say no to more projects just because I want to make sure that I'm able to give it my all to the ones that I'm currently committed to. Um, it feels but yeah, it's like been a... really exciting and fun to have all of these projects come in and there's a lot of variety and I'm able to work with a lot of different people in the guild. It's all good. Yeah, I'm curious when you're when you're choosing these projects to work on, what are like your motivations or values that make in a make a certain project more exciting than a different one? What are you looking for? Uh, I guess the product has to seem sort of interesting to me. Um, it's a, it's a weird thing to, to describe, but I kind of have this process where I'll go through the product, I'll go through their goals and like what they want design for. And it's, it's kind of a gut feeling, honestly. It's like, do I kind of have an intuitive sense of how this thing should work? And if I have some ideas brewing and I feel this sense of like excitement and expansion, then that's a really good sign that like, yeah, this is a cool project. Um, there are others which, uh, it's hard to put my finger on why, but like the perfect pool project was one that um, someone had asked me I was interested in and kind of looked through all this stuff. And I just got this feeling like, eh, it's just, I don't think it's for me. I don't, I don't have like a spark of ideas of how I can make this thing better. So it's probably better suited for someone else that has um, more of an interest in that product or um, yeah, more, more excitement because um, I, I would never want to join a project uh, where I'm not, yeah, where I'm not excited about it because uh, that doesn't serve the product, doesn't serve the team. And um, yeah, I, I guess they're just really like being useful on these projects. So um, if I see that there's either like not much I can do to help them or they don't really need the kind of support that I can bring um, or if I feel like I'm not able to give that full hearted energy, then it's not a good fit. I love that. I, I, I couldn't resonate any more with that going with the gut feeling intuition. That's what brought me into Ethereum and what has kept me inspired by the projects I've joined. And very often I feel the same, like overwhelmed with the amount of things that are going on, but that's how I can like measure like what my priorities are. Like the things I'm most excited about, they're at the top of my mind. They're not going to disappear because I'm stoked about the potential impact like of what we're building. But the things that are like, even sometimes they're better paying where I'm like, Nah, like, you know, it doesn't really, doesn't pull me, right? Or like what we're doing here doesn't inspire me to like get up and tell people about it and be excited. I'm just kind of like, all right, let's get this over with, you know? So leaning towards yeah. that as much as possible, I think is the thing that really serves us in the end. And... Mm -hmm. Totally agree. 
Yeah, I would love to just kind of orient into where you are right now with, are you like, are you only working, um, not to say only, are you completely working in the like Ethereum DAO space? Are you still doing freelance work? Like what, where, where are your efforts going right now? Yeah, sure. Um, at this moment in time, say 80% of my time is on these raid guild projects I'm involved in. Um, Cause yeah, we got three going on right now and a couple of others that are I'm contributing to. So yeah, it's like 80%. Um, but my, my life as a freelancer like is very seasonal. Um, <clears throat> like as projects kind of pop up, my attention will shift uh, to different things. Um, right now about 20% of my time is going into this side project that I started on my own, which is outside of crypto. Um, my, my mission is to help creative solopreneurs build websites fast and cheap. Um, yeah, because I noticed that a lot of my creative friends, a lot of my artist friends, crafting folks, uh, a place where they really get blocked is getting their website together. And um, me living in the tech realm for like 10 years now, websites are easy. So <laughs> I'm like, okay, how do I translate, um, translate what I know about how to build a website fast and cheap and package it in a way that someone who's not technical at all can easily start engaging with and um, yeah, get that thing set up for themselves. I've got a, I've got a confession to make. Uh, I still, as a freelancer, don't have a website for myself or my own services. Um, I, so yeah, like, let me know when you're ready. I'll be in your beta, like. <laughs> Sweet. I've been looking yeah, for I mean. I am accepting applications now. <laughs> uh, I'll give you a good rate. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that side hustle is called Citrine Labs. And um, yeah, I, I use Squarespace as a platform because uh, I find that the UI is pretty intuitive, easy for my clients to use. Um, so most of the work I do is I kind of act as a coach where I'm speaking with people about like, what are your goals? <laughs> what are you trying to do with this website? Is it earning revenue? Is it getting more people to contact you? Like really digging down into like, what is the purpose? Um, and then helping folks get their content together, actually figuring out how to write about themselves, how to sell, how to market the thing that they're trying, yeah, trying to sell. Um, and then I kind of like hop in on the technical step side where I'll actually design the website, put, set it all up in Squarespace, um, and then educate or train folks like this is how you update your text. This is how you update your images. Um, but yeah, my goal is really to set up these systems that are kind of like don't require a lot of maintenance. Yeah, like as a, as a small business owner or a side hustler, like you don't want to be spending 10 hours a week trying to maintain your website. Like maybe all you need to do is update a paragraph of text. So with Squarespace, you can just go on your website, you hit escape, that puts you into edit mode. You can just like click into the text, edit it and hit save and you're done. Um, it, it which I think be, is really cool. It should be as simple as like posting on social media or something, right? Like yeah. that, that would be ideal. I wonder though, like why better services like that don't already exist? Is there an inherent value that that we're missing there where mm. services or platform providers can kind of like upsell you like maintenance or um, mm. is there is or is there like a barrier so that's like we should go through the developers to do these things, right? Like instead of being able to do them ourselves. Yeah, I guess I, I think the traditional way of building websites has been you hire a designer to make pixel perfect mockups and then you hire developers to build the thing from scratch, which totally works. And for some businesses that makes sense. 
Uh, but for the vast majority of people, it's not it's not worth hiring a developer to build a site that is primarily just content, um, which is why Squarespace is so interesting to me because they have like, templates. It's really easy to tweak the design and stuff like that. Um, but the issue I've seen in um, these creative solopreneurs I'm working with is even though Squarespace is built for those people and is meant to be very user friendly, these folks still f have this feeling of being blocked. They feel overwhelmed. They feel like they're not technical enough. Uh, they're afraid they're going to mess something up or their site's going to go offline if they like make a mistake. So um, I think there's a lot of fear around around that that's not currently being addressed with the straight up like tooling side. Um, so I kind of think about there's this opportunity to be like a website coach or therapist, <laughs> something like that, where it's like, okay, like we're gonna make progress this week. This is the thing we're gonna work on. Um, here are your to-dos, here are your action items. Um, it's it, kind of like that social support that I think is missing. It feels like there's a very empathic thing here. Like you want to help people essentially. Is, is that a part of your experience or something that you like, you like to do like even outside of like this space or the workspace in general? Yeah. I would, I would even add on to that and say, not just help people, but make every, it seems like everything you've worked on, you've made in some way more accessible to more people and served as kind of like a bridge between the technical and the kind of lay person who wants to be involved, but not necessarily to the full extent of technical knowledge of the thing that they're engaging with. And that's just, I don't know if I have a question attached to that, but it's just really cool. It's really awesome because you're making, you're making all of this, um, all of these spaces, whether from website platforms to, I don't even know what the term is, crypto platforms, just more, more accessible. And, um, yeah, I'm, yeah, it's really cool. So kudos to that. Thanks. I know I wanted to elaborate more on your, yeah, kind of motivations, but that's kind of what I've picked up on. Yeah, you said the word bridge. And I think that's totally accurate. <laughs> um, I really do see <clears throat> my role in the work that I've done is, as trying to bridge the gap between highly technical things and people who see themselves as not tech savvy. And of course, in, in web design, that gap is not that big, really. I think people just need some encouragement some motivation, some like, yeah, you can totally learn this. You've got this. Like, I'm going to show you how it's, you can do it and then you can manage it yourself. Um, but then in crypto, the gap is vast. It's like <clears throat> the people who are in the space or a lot of people in the space are like, oh yeah, this smart contract is this thing and the other thing. And here's the private key and the public key. And they just, these, these like words and these terms, come out so naturally and it's almost like when they're so immersed in this space they forget how much they actually know and how much they've learned um, and someone coming into the space is like what is a public key what is that <laughs> oh you mean i'm holding my own tokens why what is my password to bitcoin <laughs> you know <laughs> like i get that a lot from people who are brand new to the space like oh where do i log into the bitcoin company kind of thing. So the gap is is very wide in crypto. And so that space is really exciting because there's a lot of opportunity <clears throat> to contribute as like a designer, as a content person, as a marketer, as a community builder. Um, I, I wonder from your perspective, like speaking directly to those last three people, right? Content people, community builders, uh, designers, is there a barrier to entry that we're like not addressing for those people specifically to get into this space, to then do more of that bridging work that you're doing? Um, yeah. Yeah, totally. I think there, 
there's more we could do. And maybe there are resources out there that I just don't know about. Um, like one specific example for the Ethereum community <clears throat> is like the MetaMask thing. How, at least in the work we do, like within the DAO, like having a MetaMask wallet is like, you need that to log into things. But for someone who's brand new, they're like, what, I need this other account? Can I trust that? I don't know. Like, it's almost like we need a getting started pack for people get, getting into the space. Like a glossary of terms, um, some like videos explaining how a smart contract works, how, or even zooming out even more, like how the blockchain works um, and, and catering yeah, more content toward like, hey, actually, like, this is totally a thing you can learn. You don't have to be an engineer to learn this stuff. Um, and like, here's a set of tools that you need to kind of get started and kick off your journey in the space. I wonder, though, like, when you found out at some age, you found out about the internet, right? But did you have to go to a did you have to go to a place to find out about it? Or were you just like on the internet? Cause there was things you wanted to use, right? You were like doing AOL instant messenger and, or something like that, right? Yeah. Um, like how is that different from people onboarding themselves into the internet versus onboarding themselves into like using crypto native platforms? Mm. Well, with crypto, we're dealing with Val like value, like moving value around. And I think not always, but um, I've noticed that when I talk about crypto, people think money and investments. And so when I say like, oh, there's this cool app that uses Ethereum, there's already that fear. Like, what if I lose my money? What if this is like not a good place for me to put my money? And it's, there's like a lot of, yeah, fear and uncertainty around the value of the token aspect. Whereas on the internet, like AOL Messenger, you can use that for free and you can play around. And if you don't like it, you're, you just don't use it anymore. Um, so it felt like the ri it feels like the risks were lower to enter the web, right? But also there was something you really wanted to do, right? If your friends are all on AOL and you want to talk to them, you have to be there. So you have to figure out how to click around and how to type and how to do how to make an account. Um, yeah but the desire for people to be there was strong. Cause you're like, well, they're doing it and I want to be there doing it too. Um, yeah. Do you think we're missing that with Ethereum? Like we have some cool things, right? And I guess like, unfortunately, in my opinion, the coolest things we're doing right now are value transfers and things like token yield farming and all these wacky things that I really honestly don't know anything about, but that are making the biggest news um, in the headlines and stuff, all of the money that's locked up in DeFi, you know, the world normally, normal people seem really excited about, but like, that's actually not the most cool and innovative thing that you can do with Ethereum, not even, right? That's just like a base layer functionality that has a whole expansive range of possibilities that are, that we know about, right? Because we are here in it. We can, we've researched and we've seen the potential for the technology to like impact humanity, to shift society in a way that's like massive forward. Um, but other people, they just think like, oh, I'm going to buy some coins and maybe they'll make money and then I'll sell them and be done with it. But like, that's actually mm -hmm. like, that's not, that's not it at all. Like that, maybe we're doing a bad job of like not relaying that information about, hey, what's, po what's possible here is massive yeah. change, like massive, future evolution of e economic systems and such. Yeah, totally. I think there's a huge um, opportunity to share more use cases for this technology, share more like interesting ways that this tech is helping us make a positive impact on the world. Um, and like, honestly, I, I I felt this way <clears throat> when I was in the Bitcoin community as well. Um, there's this tendency to like be where other people that you know and know like the things that you like are. And so it kind of creates this like 
well, it's a really strong community for sure, which is awesome, but it kind of becomes a bubble um, where we're like working on these cool projects with other people who are also in, in ETH. Um, but I think we can do more to say like, oh, let's reach out to this organization that's totally not crypto related at all, but I think they would really dig this project we're working on. Um, so like bridging the gap between, yeah, the ETH world and the non, non ETH world. <clears throat> and like a thing that pops in my mind, uh, just as I'm thinking about it, sorry. Um, I think about crypto kitties when crypto kitties came out. <clears throat> There was so much excitement and hype around that. And even people that were outside of the crypto bubble were like, oh yeah, crypto kitties sounds so fun. I want to try it. And then they get in there and they realize they have to pay like $20 to like put, put in a transaction. And they're like putting all this money in and not really getting any value back. So I think there, some people have had some experiences like that where they're like, oh yeah, I tried that Web3 stuff. and." It, I didn't really get it or I lost a bunch of money trying to use it. Um, so you feel like maybe CryptoKitties was kind of a flop in that sense, even though it got a ton of attention in the public mainstream, which, and just for other people, CryptoKitties were collectible digital cats and you bought them with Ethereum. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's pretty funny, right? So you bought them with Ethereum and then you could breed them and you could make more collectible cats that you would sell to other people, right? And there was definitely some expensive cats. There were many thousand dollar dragon cats, dragon unicorn cats that people were collecting. Um, but in the end, maybe like it fizzled out because it's like how it's like Pokemon, but virtual, right? And actually like, I've never played Pokemon, so I wouldn't know. But like with Pokemon, you can play a game, right? Like you can exchange them and have them fight. But this is just like, you're like collecting and breeding and then reselling, yeah. Uh, do you have any crypto kitties, Yeller? Yes, I have one. I have one crypto kitty named Lester. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I have a few. I um, had to. Have you, I do have a lot. <laughs> you do. No, you? like, <laughs> You're like, I, I have like 25. maybe five. Got it. Five. All right. That's um, a reasonable amount. Yeah, like for a while, I was like, oh yeah, I want to breathe. And like, I don't know. I love games where I'm caring for animals and like breeding more animals. I don't know what that is, but <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I wanted to try it out and just see what the hype was about. And I don't know, for me, it just became unusable because um, at the time um, transactions uh, were picking up and the gas fees were so high that to do anything in the game, I had to pay like $25. And it was like, what yeah. am I getting out of this really? Yeah. Well, when it comes down to that, right? Like you're like, wait, what? I'm like actually losing money doing this, playing the game that I wanted to play. And that yeah. is what we're seeing again. Like this huge period of like yield farming stuff and DeFi activity has sent the gas prices through the roof for making any transactions to do anything on Ethereum. And it's, it's really taking the fun and usability out of it. Um, mm -hmm. Which is why, you know, it's like using side chains like XDAI and other projects are really kind of like exciting and interesting to me because they feel like they're making it making it usable again right like yeah. i want to do things i don't know how to trade or like i always lose money when i buy tokens so i just hold on to ethereum in the end but mm -hmm. i want to like take activity i want to vote on things i want to you know be a part of like the actions and interactions that are happening specifically with using blockchains but if it's if it's cost prohibitive then it's, it doesn't just suck for us. It sucks for the people who we hope will adopt this technology one day. And it definitely doesn't uh, become accessible to the people who we like say blockchains will liberate from. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Um, in my opinion, transaction fees, probably top three, if not the top obstacle to um, mainstream adoption because like we feel okay about spending ten dollars to sign a transaction or to vote on something in the DAO because we are users of the tech we're believers in the tech we're trying to push it forward and so it's like oh this is kind of a small price to pay to to interact with the system um, but yeah it's it's not accessible currently 
And we went through the same issue in the Bitcoin community in 2016 um, when I was working at Purse. Uh, there was a point in time where a transaction was costing $50 to send. Um, so there were people writing in saying, I bought a $20 item and I paid, had to pay $50 in transaction fees to do it. Um, and so we saw a huge drop off of, yeah, of users, purchases. Um, people just kind of gave up on using Bitcoin for e-commerce at that point. Um, and that, that really hurt Purse as a company, but I know it wasn't just us. It was every, yeah, every um, company in the Bitcoin space during that time. Um, and so that's why like we started getting interested in things like Bitcoin Cash and uh, yeah, other Litecoin, you know, thinking about supporting other coins just to provide an option for our customers who are like living in Venezuela, for example, um, trying to buy toilet paper, you know, <laughs> like to, to them, $20 is a lot of money. So <clears throat> yeah, that was a huge issue back then. Same issue here today, definitely a huge opportunity, something for us to figure out. I, I just want to, I don't want to take too much more of your time because I know we're getting up to the hour, but Speaking of like motivation and kind of like accessibility, like what are some of the things that kind of inspire you and like make you stick around in this, in this space? I would say like, I didn't really know much about DAOs before I joined Raid Guild, you know, confession. <laughs> I didn't really, understand much of how they worked. Um, but now that I'm in it, I, I see a huge opportunity for um, ways that we can distribute resources in a more equitable way. Um, like I think about a traditional corporation, like Visa, their CEO is making $20 million a year to sit in board meetings all day while their engineers uh, or even their customers for people are like, yeah, not <laughs> making nearly that much, you know? Um, their janitors in the company are probably making minimum wage. Um, so there's just a lot of income inequality in traditional corporations and that infuriates me. <laughs> And so I'm um, really excited about the concept of DAOs and the potential it could have for yeah, distributing resources based on effort and how much value you're bringing to the org. Um, you know, in Raid Guild, if you're working hard, you're contributing to projects, you're shipping code, like you get compensated for it. Like, that's how it should work. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that really excites me. And um, one, of, one of the things that excited me about Bitcoin in the beginning was hearing stories of um, difficulties. Um, <clears throat> basically, there are some restrictions in Afghanistan um, for women and how they can control their money. Um, from what I understand, in Afghanistan, you are not allowed to open a bank account in your own name as a woman. Uh, you, your dad has to do it for you or your husband has to do it for you. And so like, that's uh, really fucked up. <laughs> and um, yeah, I started hearing about projects where um, it sound, kind of sounds like the way that the DAOs were working. Um, but back then it was just like women or even teenage girls in Afghanistan learning how to code and doing work for companies overseas, um, different countries, um, they were able to get paid in Bitcoin and control their own funds. And that's pretty awesome. It's a, it's a powerful sidestep, right? Where you're like, yeah. oh, we can't play in your game. Well, guess what? We just jumped a generation. We're gonna like, we're gonna work with this generation that is like, naturally accessible to anybody who's willing to write, dive down the rabbit hole and teach themselves or provide value in a community. Mm -hmm. um, that's huge, right? That's, 
that feels like something that's it oversteps all the cultural errors of i don't know, know what we want to call them like religious training or these kind of things right or uh historical dominator complexes from the masculine cultures but it's it's like they can just opt out of that and they can mm -hmm have value driven to them in a totally different way, in a direct way. Um, yeah, that's like, I want to do more of that, right? I want to get closer to that. How do we empower more people to like rise up out of their like really trapped situation and yeah. take control of, of their lives and their, their, their careers and their financial independence? Yeah. Financial freedom for all. <laughs> <laughs>